Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and today I'm thrilled to be talking about the wonderful series Loki with Sofia de Martino, who plays the fantastic character Sylvie in the series. And starting off, I wanted to talk about creating this character because from the very beginning, you've really created this character who's so fully her own. Um, but there's these little threads of connectivity to Loki that I love that you've interspersed and even just the detail of, you know, when she's in fight sequences, having some of that physicality look the same. And so kind of going back to season one, I was really interested in how you set out to craft and create this character with her own identity, but finding those little tiny connective threads in between. Yeah, so if we're thinking about series one, I guess um, I always knew that Sylvie was a variant of, of Loki. So when I first started to research the character or sort of try and, try and build her, um, I looked at all of Tom's work and, and looked at how he played Loki, watched him, <laughs> became a little bit of a, a Loki nerd and then um, let that sort of, percolate and sit with me and then I try to forget it all so certain things have stuck so you know Sylvie has the same sort of mischief and um I wanted her to to be cheeky and a little bit cocky and have all of those fun aspects that Loki has as well um but like you say to be to be fully her own character and her own woman um yeah and then training for the fight sequences is always fun because there is choreo that you you sort of stick to and Sylvie has her very own unique fighting style she's she's a brawler and she's she loves fighting but she sort of gets down and dirty she's a boxer she wants to sort of wrestle and get really in there whereas Loki's more balletic and um sort of more upright in the way he fights um but Tom and I when we were filming, decided that it would be really cool to sort of mirror each other, especially in the first series when we're fighting a lot. Um, so yeah, it was it, it was sort of born on set and, and we kind of came up with it ourselves that we would try and choreograph little bits where we're walking in time or where we draw our swords at the same time in the same way, or we have um, a certain stance that mirrors each other. Uh, yeah, and we thought that that would be a fun thing to play with. Um, and that and that continued into series two as well. And I, I love that from the from the get go, you really kind of allowed her to lean into some of the grittiness and the sharp edges in a really realistic way that was so true to her backstory and who she was as a person. And then obviously going into season two, you're not going to suddenly drop all of those elements, but you've kind of allowed her to like soften a little bit at the beginning. You know, she doesn't have to be on the defense or looking to go on the attack as much. And so how did you set about figuring out what does that landscape of emotion look like her in a way that's a little bit different to season one? So yeah, series one, Sylvie's on the run and she's trying to get revenge and she's just really angry. Series two was fun to be able to, like you say, let her soften a little bit and let her have a rest. And I guess that's where it started for me, just imagining this this person has been on the run for years and she's exhausted and she it's just letting the character have a taste of what it's like to be human and it was important for me to sort of, to see S Sylvie try and make some human connections and to, to just see something more accessible in her in that way. Um, and it's also really important that she, she got a chance to live somewhere in one place, put some roots down and really try and live a normal human existence. Um, because then, of course, in series two, she has that threatened and eventually taken away from her. And, and that was important to show the, the journey there and how important those things had become to her. Um, so, yeah, it's even more devastating in the end, because I think you see through Sylvie um, how these human connections and feeling of belonging is what makes us human and what makes us, um, what, what makes life worth living and, and what gives us something to fight for. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, to have that threatened is, is, yeah. is, is, is scary. 
But she, she's also in a space of, of trying to build friendships. And that's something that she's never really had the opportunity to have. You know, there's always been kind of this this real loneliness about her. And so how how did you think about what does it look like if she does start to try and let people in? Because it's not a natural instinct to her. It's something that she's, in essence, learning for the very first time. Yeah. So I likened it to almost like when you go away to university or college and you're so awkward in yourself, you're not fully grown in yourself. It's a bit of an identity crisis moment where you don't quite know how to exist in the world yet. So it's super awkward. She, you know, she's she's a weirdo. She's a weirdo in this space. She's not like the normal person in, in this new world. So she's always kind of awkward. It's always hard work. She's but she's also got that confidence because she's Sylvie. So when she goes into McDonald's for the first time and she asks to try everything on the menu, she's still sort of like a bit cocky and overconfident, but also aware that everyone's, you know, staring at her. Um, so she's 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 having to drop her guard down and be vulnerable for the first time, which is not natural for Sylvie at all. Um, and I think, interestingly, that's where she finds a new strength because it takes a lot of strength and courage to be vulnerable. And that is her big lesson in, in series two. I love that you're bringing up the McDonald's um, of it all as well, because I love the way in which that that came up, which was in essence, you being asked, where do you think Sylvie goes in season two? And just kind of that feeling of, you know, she's just been running and fighting so much for her whole life. She's probably just hungry and wants a burger. Um, and so I just wanted to ask about, you know, the experience of working on a show where you didn't necessarily know that that conversation was going to lead into that entire storyline for season two, but just a collaborative environment where you have a voice and people are interested in what you think about the character where you see her going yeah I mean I'm used to working on you know little comedies in the UK where you get to improvise a lot and you know you you get to play around and it, it's um yeah you can have a creative input I guess my preconception of working on a big Marvel Disney show was that it's not like that and you know you just say what's written in the script and that's as far as your you know that's what your job is but it, it's not true. It's hugely collaborative. And um, yeah, you can have a silly idea, what you think is a silly idea, and then it ends up being the beginning of a new series. So it's great. And people, you know, listen to each other. And it really is a, a sort of team effort, um, building a series like that and writing a story like that. And um you know, you look at Tom and he knows Loki better than anyone. So his input is vital into the storyline and, and what that character's doing and thinking and feeling and wanting. And I guess the same is is for for me and Sylvie, you know, I I, I know her so well that I, I know how she would react in any situation. Um and I guess that's really important when you're when you're writing a new story and the writers you know having the writers listen to us and take into account what we think is just amazing it's great and I think it makes for a better show and it, it's so great as well to kind of see the the external like the physical aspects of who Sylvie is as a character in season two as well and even just you know from the haircut where Wakana who was the hair and makeup designer was like it's a wolf cut and kind of like had a very specific vision down to the way that the costumes look um, and so how did that help you to find different facets of Sylvie but also um, I've heard you say that just anytime you have a character the moment that you put the shoes on or the boots on with Sylvie that it kind of seeps you into her and it was the same boots for you in season two as season one so how did that consistency help while also still finding new facets yeah so I think having the year given to us was really helpful so we knew it was going to be 1982 mm -hmm. so all of the music all of the fashion was going to be 1980s early 1980s um so being able to put her in that decade was a sort of given um and then I guess it's thinking what Sylvie would do in that decade. So she's quite punk and she's pretty rock and roll and she's a bit of a mess and she likes, you know, she's not a pretty girl. So just sort of going down that path and thinking about how she would, what she'd wear, what she'd do, it's always going to be super comfy. She's always going to want to be able to run or fight if she needs to, e even in this new series, like that's just the way she is. She's never going to be wearing high heels or anything uncomfortable. Um, and then, yeah, just the boots, yeah, the boots were the same from the from the first series. So 
it, sh it just felt the same to to walk literally in her shoes and um though the boots I don't know they're, they're just quite kick-ass they're just quite badass boots just to put a big pair of black boots on <laughs> makes you feel confident as a as a woman and it makes me feel like I don't know it makes me stand in a certain way hold myself in a different way um and in my own personal life I've always been a chunky boot wearer I just think it's um it's it's something that we share and that yeah I find a lot of strength from it's gonna hurt if you kick someone with one of those on <laughs> definitely I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that I no, mean either I also wanted to talk about the way in which music is a really helpful tool for you in terms of finding character and, and finding emotion. Um, you know, particularly looking at the, the record store sequence in episode five, where, you know, nobody knew yet what the final song in that sequence was going to end up being. And so you were listening to Purple Rain, um, but also just the process of, you know, creating a playlist for Sylvie with things like Stevie Nicks, Edge of Seventeen, like PJ Harvey, Kate Bush, and kind of how that really helps you to get into the space of her. Yeah, so yeah, I made I made this playlist. I, I do it for every job I do. Um, it just helps me get into the playlist of the character, but also I just like listening to music. So it's also it's just some of my favorite music and some of the music that makes me feel strong and excited and present. And um, on that Sylvie playlist, there's a lot of incredible, you know, women with guitars. Um, Stevie Nicks is a big hero of mine, so <laughs> she's on every playlist. <laughs> I, I really, really love that, you know, and, and and also in the way that you play her, you know, there's this kind of like feral aspect. And I've heard you say that she's kind of like a little bit of a feral wild cat. Um, and was that one of the things that you kind of cottoned on to very early with her, particularly when it comes to a lot of her movement and the physicality of her? Yeah, definitely. I think there's something about Tom's portrayal of Loki that's quite cat-like as well, but he's more of like a graceful jaguar or something. <laughs> Whereas Sylvie is the feral wild cat. Yeah. Um, it's just something quite like ready to pounce about her. Um, super loyal. Um, and yeah, there's something about her physicality that is um her reflexes or her sort of scrappiness um that's quite cat-like I can imagine Sylvie having a pet cat as well she's not a dog girl she's definitely a cat lady <laughs> we should we should see that in season three <laughs> right <laughs> And, and also even, you know, there's there's so many great details that kind of go into what you've built in her and even just the accent and the dialect, like you very specifically didn't want it to be too posh and you wanted it to kind of feel representative of her, her upbringing and her background. And so did, was that the dialect and the accent that you landed on first or did you kind of experiment with different potential options and kind of find that eventually? It was just instinct. That's the first thing that, that made sense for me um, to just keep her a bit, rough and ready and not too polished and also different to Tom's Loki um um I didn't want to I didn't want to sort of posh it up just for the sake of it because she's that's not who she is um I think it works quite well it's also nice just to be able to do a more Midlands twang in a character because I've never I, I don't really get a chance to do that so it's, yeah it's fun yeah there's there's a great musicality to that accent I love it yeah. <laughs> it's quite nice when you're sort of um taking the piss out of someone as well or when you're winding someone up it is the accent it just works quite well <laughs> I also wanted to ask about, you know, the experience of of getting to film a scene in a moment where essentially you're recreating a moment from season one because Sylvie's in the present has moved so far past that, but you had to kind of step back into who she was in the past. And, and I know that you were kind of looking back at some of the scenes from season one and like really studying it um, and was just interested in what that process looked like for you. Yeah, that was crazy because it was a it was a good few years between filming it the first time and then having to go back the second time. Again, the costume really helps just to be back in series one costume and have a wig actually to look like my own hair two years previously was really helpful. And um, yeah, just to rewatch it and try and get, try and get back into that headspace of sort of angry Sylvie just before she's killed. 
Matthew Hugh remains. It was fun to revisit that. I never thought I'd get to reshoot that scene. So you don't often get to do that. I also wanted to talk about the the dynamic that you've created between Sylvie and Loki because, um, you know, when he first shows up and she's kind of like, I've created this version of a life that I want to try living in for a bit, you know, there's a real tension to it because he's threatening to disrupt it and ultimately does. But it's very different to the tension that existed between them in season one because season one was very much getting to know each other and it was all quite new and fresh and now there's so much history seeped in between these two characters and so how did you want that tension that starts to exist between them in that space to feel a little bit different to what you created previously so yeah you're right the first series was more about getting to know each other and finding each other annoying and winding each other up and sort of learning what was similar and what was different about us and then the second series was more what it feels like when you run into your ex. It was a bit more like that dynamic, like, oh, this is so much, there's so much history. There's so much to say, there's so much unsaid. Um, and that first moment where they see each other in McDonald's is just so charged, isn't it? And from Sylvie's point of view, it's just don't mess this up for me. Think, yeah <laughs> and and also in in terms of of her as a character I love that there's this kind of balance of there's a lot of cynicism in her but there's also a lot of hopefulness you know even with everything she's gone through in her life she still always wants better for not just herself but everyone around her um, and society as a whole and especially kind of as you were looking towards that final episode and everything that she's facing and all those challenges how did you want to to create that dynamic where she still allows hopefulness to exist within her? I think from Sylvie's point of view, she's always fighting the good fight. She truly believes that people should have free will and that anything that gets in the way of that, it's her job to see it off. So um, she she just stays true to herself all the way through to the end and I think the the ending is surprising for Sylvie as well, as well as everyone watching it, um, that people do end up with free will, but it's in a, in, a, in a way that she didn't expect. And it's a sort of, it's a sad payoff, you know, to, to, to lose Loki, um, but to get what she wanted. And, and lastly, you were mentioning earlier, you know, obviously it was a very different experience getting the opportunity to come back into season two and to know her so well and to just have this intrinsic gut instinct of how she was going to respond to situations. And so I was just really interested in how that created a really different dynamic and experience in filming season two because of the relationship that you have with her now. I was just really excited to jump back in and to to be Sylvie again um and and find new ways of being her and just learn more about her she's in such a different space in series two it was it was quite a gift as an actor to to play the same character into such a different world it doesn't happen very often um and also really fun just to to go back and be it sylvie again because that's when i think she's weirdly at her most sylvie <laughs> I, I love that point of of kind of playing her, but in a totally different space. And I think that's part of what made your performance so wonderful to watch in season two. So congratulations on an amazing series. And thank you so much for sharing all of this. It's been really wonderful. Thank you. What a lovely interview. Really nice to meet you. Thank you.